Hey everybody, before I start this uh, last part, I want to let you know, we, yeah, we do have the LC102 done, it's fixed, but uh, I want to preface this last video with a, uh, just a shout out to all of you who really went over the top in the comments section with emails, with responses, all kinds of things, helping me to be able to understand and repair this LC102. So thank you all. And I just want to share with you something that's just some extraordinary, extraordinarily uh, generous contribution that one of you viewers made. Uh, I've shown some other things that some of you have done. This is wonderful, and I just wanted to thank you personally for it. Thank all of you out there for your, for your great support and help. So let's take a look at this real quick, and you'll see why I'm so jazzed by this. So I received this in the mail this, this morning, and uh, I had already finished filming the last part to this series when this came in the mail today, and I had to go down to the post office and sign for it. And what you're looking at is an absolutely perfect, legible, pristine, <laughs> annotated version of the schematics for this thing. And it is, well, I'll read you the little note he put on the first page. You can see this, Tony, the prints are done on Canon photo paper and are suitable for framing, although you may not want to remember this project. P.S. They are printed using pigment ink that should last in excess of 100 years. So uh, even though I will not be here in 100 years, who knows, maybe this thing will be, and the next person that has to work on it uh, may not have to go through all I did to figure it out. <laughs> but the reason I'm so amazed by this is, let's look, let me show you one example here. All of, you know, all of the pages are like this. They're just absolutely pristine. And when you look at this, I struggled so much through this whole repair just trying to make out what all of these uh, different lines were, because this is just illegible on all the schematics I have, and I even have the original bed sheets. Let me show you an example. Look how big this thing is. It unfolds. It is absolutely gargantuan. It won't fit on the camera. I mean, look how big this is. There's my hand. <laughs> and however, when you look at it, even using this schematic, when you try to look at some of these lines, they're very, very hard to read. See how smudged up they are? And you can see some of them are a little more legible than others, but it's just, it's hard to see some of these things. But you look on these schematics that he sent, that Jay sent, take a look at this. Just absolutely perfect. And he even annotated them and gave us colored signal paths. Absolutely amazing. Look at that. So now I have a really good set of schematics moving forward if I ever need to service this thing again. Armed with that and the knowledge I've acquired from you and from my own experience on this, uh, we should be able to service these moving forward, huh? So I just wanted to thank Jay and I want to thank all of you folks out there for all that you've done. I, I'm just so moved by that. I can't believe that there are so many good people out there that are willing to, you know, come together and work together on a project like this. It was a lot of fun. This is probably one of the most fun projects I've done on this channel, and I have. I'm pushing three, four hundred videos out there, but honestly, I've never had the outpouring of support and interaction and all the good things I really like about doing this. Uh, just didn't, uh, not to the degree we had on this video. So thank you all, and I appreciate it, and we'll do some more stuff like this in the future. You know, we'll do the audio things, but we'll also do the test equipment and some of the other logic troubleshooting things, and we'll try to mix it up. But it was a lot of fun, and I just wanted to say thank you all. Hi, everybody. Well, guess what? It is fixed. <laughs> it's actually working. We got it all taken care of. We'll talk a little bit about what it turned out to be. Uh, but let's first do a demo of how it works. 
we'll just look at a couple things and then we'll talk about some of the things I could and could not do and where we ended up. So first let's turn it on and a lot of you uh, made comments about the the hard to see display and it's you're absolutely right. Putting a shiny <laughs> you know, mylar cover over an LCD display with no backlight is just making it impossible to see. Unless you're looking straight on it, very hard to see, but hey, it is what it is. You gotta play the hand you're dealt, as they say. So first thing, let's look at what this thing is supposed to do whenever you are zeroing the leads. So if you short the leads like this, I'm just using this lead as a short and I hit shorts, you will see it travels across just like it was with the open. If we go to open leads, same thing, albeit a little bit faster. Okay, so the leads are now zeroed. So let's look at a couple of components here. So first thing, we'll look at our 1500 microfarad or picofarad again. So if we hit capacitor, and by the way, if you're looking at the capacitor value, it really doesn't matter what kind of, whether this is selected or not. I'll show you that in a minute. Somebody commented on that. And what this is for is when you're, when you're doing pass fail tests and in certain tests, this will matter because it will control how, you know, what kind of signal it puts across the component. But anyhow, capacitor value and you can see our 1500 is pretty much right on 1500. If we go to our 1.22, what was it? 1.224 or 1.227, something like that, microfarad. And you can see very close. Here's a 0.47, and I don't know its exact capacitance. I didn't measure it on my other equipment. But 460 picofarads, 0.46. Should I say nanofarads? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right, so here is a 470 microfarad capacitor. 477 and again I can hit electrolytics hit value it's not going to change it's the same thing because it, it doesn't matter for this test here's our capacitor that we said was 2153 2153 microfarads on uh, on my HP 4276 and 2040, not too far off, pretty good. And last but not least is this Nichicon. This is the bad capacitor that we pulled out of this one that was really leaky. And if we do capacitor value, it's pretty close to 2200, see that? Now, here's the thing, if I do capacitor ESR, It's saying that it's pretty low. I mean, not bad. 0.1 ohms or so, it's respectable. But if we look at the leakage, let's put our 30, this is a 35 volt cap, so we're gonna put 35 volts. Now remember, the way you calibrate this thing, whatever voltage you select, it's going to be just slightly below that. So if you select 100 volts, it purposely will put about 98.5 volts or 97.5. It's just a, a little tiny, maybe 2% below what you're typing in. That way, if you have a 35 volt cap, you type 35 volts in, you're not going to exceed 35 volts on that capacitor when you test it. That's why they do it. Okay, capacitor leakage. You could see 40, about 330 microamps, and if we go to ohms, you could see there, 
there is a lot of leakage. This was a very leaky cap. And if you remember when we used our, uh, our homemade capacitor leakage tester, it was the same thing. It was reading right around there. So this thing's very accurate. It's unbelievably accurate, <laughs> believe it or not. Now, the other thing is part of the test that you do on this is they want you to go, I believe, to one volt and then they want you to check uh, the capacitor ESR using the ESR meter. And the first thing they have you do is they have you put in a 20 ohm resistor and they want it to be a precision resistor. So here we go, 20 ohm precision resistor, ESR, 19 ohms, pretty close. If you hit the button three times, you know, it'll kind of toggle between 19 and 20. You're really getting close there. They want you to then go to a 1.5K or a 1500 ohm resistor, which is right here. There it is, 1500. And then they want you to put in a 250 ohm resistor, which is kind of in between. And there's no calibration for the 250. It's kind of between the two calibration points. That's why they have you do this. And you could see it's reading about 270. So it's pretty close, off by a teeny bit. The, then they have you go to a 15 ohm range. Fourteen point seven. I'll take that. And again, you can really fiddle with those potentiometers, even though they're single turn, and you can get it dead on if you really want to play with it. But it will drift a tiny bit with temperature and things. They want you to have this turned on for ten or fifteen minutes before you even attempt to calibrate it. So I just turned it on in front of you here. So, and then last but not least, they have you put a one ohm, and they want it to be a non-inductive resistor. This is a wire wound, so it does have a tiny bit of inductance, but still about eight, eight tenths of an ohm, okay? And it, it was actually reading about 0.97 after it was sitting for a while. Remember, all the components of this <clears throat> are slightly temperature sensitive, and it tells you that, to, that when you if you want super high accuracy, if it's that important, you have to make sure it's at, at, at its operating temperature. So anyway, it's working. Now, when it comes to the coils and the inductor tests, I really can't do much with that because I don't have the correct inductors for the calibration procedure. Although I never touched the pots, but this thing's been around the world so much, who knows. But here's a, I think, what is this? 150 micro Henry, I think. So if I do coils, inductor value, 135. So, I mean, it's in the ballpark. And I tested a couple different ones. I don't have any big inductors to test because they have some, they want you to check like an 8 Henry inductor and so forth. That was kind of difficult for me because I don't have those exact values. Um, but for instance, this is a 4700 mic micro Henry or a 4.7 milli Henry. You could see it's a four, it's saying 4.25 milli Henry. So it's within the it's in the ballpark. And again, these are not precision, so they can be plus or minus. I mean, these are this is a five percent, so it can be plus or minus five percent. Anyway. It is working, it's just we need to, if we want the inductor test to be perfect, we would have to calibrate it. But it's working. So let's take a look at what, what actually caused the failure, why we were not able to do the anything related to ESR leakage, things like that, why it was messing that up. The first thing is, how this circuit works is very difficult. Even with the theory of operation, there's a lot of things they don't tell you. And you have to kind of figure it out for yourself. Uh, first of all, a lot of these relays and things, as I said in the previous video here, part six, are directly driven by these 
74 uh, C 374 flip-flops and they if you look at the spec sheet for the the 74 C series and the 74 H C series of these they're very low current output in other words mo they, they can only handle somewhere around 25 to 30 milliamps of current on their outputs and those relays which are these ones right here they draw well with the circuitry involved with them they're going to they're going to draw about 10 amp, 10 milliamps so you're below half of the of the rating of the chip but the chip also has a maximum wattage dissipation for all the ports combined and so if more than one of the relays has to come in at, at any given time now your overall uh, the overall dissipation of the chip comes into play too you're really kind of toying with the limits of the chip the way it's designed and what I found is that the 74 C series that they originally had in here uh, they're a little bit slower reaction time. They have a lower maximum current for the output. Not much, but you know, just a few milliamps. But they have a little bit higher total dissipation. The 74HC series are less static sensitive, so they're less prone to failure from static. They have a little bit different uh, operating range as far as the high and low state um, you know what it takes to trigger the flip-flop to activate it's I think on the, the original one it's like a one one point five volts or something like or three point five volts and I think in the other one version it's like a three point two five volts so that could make a little difference but in this particular case it really doesn't the biggest difference is they have each individual port has a little bit higher current maximum current rating but the overall chip has a little bit lower wattage dissipation so it's kind of a little bit of a trade-off but I think the HC's being a newer design of the chip uh, are going to be a little bit more stable especially since they're a little bit less static sensitive and we'll see between that and putting the flyback or freewheel diodes on the coils of the relays hopefully I have not had any problems with it since and I have really done a lot with this calibrating it and so forth playing with it so that took care of that now this whole input and this whole leakage to current to voltage leakage current to voltage converter and all that this is a really interesting circuit so when the thing starts out these great big resistors on the back of the board are shorting out the inputs so somewhat and because of that 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 causes that supposedly keeps the charge off of the capacitor somewhat but if you look they do they are rated at 100 ohms 22 watts so that's a 50 ohm uh, across there now what that does is that <laughs> having only a 50 ohm load across the input terminals this tiny little signal that's being generated this is kind of a watchdog circuit so what this is going to be is this TL082 that's being kind of driven by this other circuit back here outputs a voltage it's current limited through this 47k resistor and then it's protected from you know reverse bias by a 1N4007 diode which is kind of a slow diode so in front of that they put a one of those pad 20 diodes which has the fast shutoff and extremely low back leakage so as a result it makes it protects this chip from the high voltage you could have up to a thousand volts on these terminals when testing capacitors it protects it from that so that's what this does and if you notice there is a constant it's just a tiny little voltage across here it's only millivolts and it's extremely low current so it's not affected by these resistors these discharge resistors and you can see it's directly connected between the output leads and through the fuse circuit and what this is doing is this is 
applying a constant signal to the terminals no matter what there's always a signal on there and it's highly current limited you see the input of the IC46 has four 2.2 mega ohm resistors all in series so it's four 8.8 .8 mega ohm uh, resistance here so it's very current limited so if you put something put a capacitor that has a charge on it yes that charge can actually get into the circuit but it's so current limited that hopefully <laughs> it will protect it although we saw that it doesn't always do that um, so what what you have is you have this little oscillator circuit and so forth this little circuit in here and you have this speaker it's this sound alert I don't this is not really an oscillator but it's a you have this speaker sound alert whatever you want buzzer on the leakage board and what happens is if there's no signal between this fuse and the probe that it can sense through here it's going to trigger this speaker and you're going to get that that tone that and that light will light up that will tell you that the fuse is blown so that's the open fuse uh, warning and it also that tells you it uh, so it just kind of protects against that or at least it will let you know that the fuse is open um, this purple line so you see the dotted line that's coming in from the leakage board and that's from your leakage supply so this is the su variable supply that's current limited that can go from anywhere from uh, one volt up to a thousand volts and you can see it goes through here and it goes through L3 which is a single pole double throw relay and L3 is the clear right here this clear relay and that's the one that's responsible for uh, bringing that in a bringing this leakage supply into the terminals and through the fuse and out to the device under test so when this is pulled in you're connecting your leakage supply to the probes when it's dropped out you're connecting the probe to the sense circuit up through here and then what happens is after it senses it it'll it'll read it'll apply whatever load that it's trying to test to the device under test it'll it'll read it through there then it when it's done it will pull L2 in which will uh, remove that from the signal and it will this will this also drops out this L4 while it's doing all this while it was checking and this is how it's testing the device under test by bringing these in and out and then you change you you can adjust the range of those tests by these three relays right here and we talked about those with the three precision resistors for the different scales for your leakage current feedback once everything's done these return to their normally open state and these re, this one returns to its normally closed state and brings the big discharge resistors in and it discharges the load through you know through the relays and through those resistors and to ground really interesting how this all works now while this is all going on <laughs> you have these current sources up here and they are being pulsed in conjunction with the TR40 and TR41 which set which basically set this comparator circuit for the readback and if you see the pink line that I drew there each one of them has a F number or P number for the port and those refer to the ports on again on IC12 and IC12 is the one that kept failing on us because again not only does it drive that you have IC11 and 12 but these two not only drive the current sources but they also control some of the relays 
So there's a, there's a lot of things where the device under test and the relay coils and everything are interacting with these two chips. These chips are really kind of put under a, a little bit of stress and no wonder they fail. So they've both been replaced with 74 HC 374s and the logic levels work with those and they seem to be more reliable. So we'll, time will tell if that's a good idea or not, but so far it seems to be working extremely well. Now for the ESR measurement and things that involve measuring resistance of the device under test, you know, whether it be an equivalent resistance or an actual resistance, this whole circuit controls that. So you have, again, you have the ports from these chips here that are turning on the different measurement ranges, you can see, and you have the ESR comparator circuits and these are setting up, these two things are references that are driving this last section of IC22. And you have these bilateral switches. And you have a voltage here that can vary. And it it's, can change based on, you know, what test parameters you have and what device you have connected to it. So these change. And they change together. You can see it's just one voltage. It's all tied together. This can actually squelch that out. This can shut the thing down and, and it, in fact it does. It resets all of this because it works off of like a capacitive reactance. It's actually generating a ramp through a capacitor. It's through these mylar capacitors. It's all precision. And these bilateral switches, one is controlled by the controller through one of these flip-flops and the other one is controlled by this series of, uh, well, they're inverters, but they're NAND gates that are being configured as inverters. And they're controlled as well by one of the ports up here, you can see. So these things are supposed to toggle to change the ranges of this op amp right here, which goes directly into this uh, multiplexer chip and then goes directly into your A to D converter. And if these don't switch properly, the scale never doesn't come doesn't isn't correct. No matter how you set this R20, it'll never read that 20 ohms or anything that you're reading and setting with these things. So these have to be able to switch. And what was happening was they weren't switching. Now, kind of hard to test this stuff in circuit. So I replaced the 4066 and magically it started working. So when I took the 4066 out, I took my little component tester, and this is a IC identifier. You can buy these on eBay or whatever, they're cheap. But if I put this chip in here, this is the original out of the unit. I meticulously desoldered it. You can see the component is not found. But if I take a brand new 4066 and I drop it in here, like so, 4066 or 4016, these are similar chips. So we had a bad chip. <laughs> Took a long time to come to that because I had to really come to an understanding of how this all works first to see what was going on. But this one right here, pins eight, six, eight, and nine, they were real hard zero volts. They weren't like a couple of millivolts like you would normally see when you're looking at a low state. They were flat out 0.00, .00 volts. And that led me to believe that this right here was not working. And in fact, that was the problem. And it never changed states. No matter what mode you were in, no matter what you were testing or not testing, this never changed states. So that led me to think, well, that has to be the problem. And in fact, it was. So we had a bad 4066. We had a bad IC12 in the very beginning first video, right? We had what I think was two bad ports or one bad port on the MCU, which, you know, who knows from all this going on. We had a bad, one of these two pad diodes was bad, 
if you remember, we tested bad. So we had several things. Now, I want to say after saying all that, that I don't think all these things failed when the original owner was using it and it went down. I think that IC12 was the biggest culprit of what failed. And then this thing went to be repaired and it was very difficult to troubleshoot. And I think the individual who was supposed to be experienced on these, he actually, that's what he did was repair these. So I have no doubt what he was doing was all correct. But he was mid troubleshooting. And there were components that had been removed and put back on the board. There were other components that had been swapped out. And there was it was left in, a, in an unknown condition when I received it. So there were so many other things I had to kind of unravel and figure out before I could really get to the bottom of what, every, what was wrong with everything. But in the end, patience and perseverance, <laughs> you can do this. Now, a couple of mods that I made, as I said before, was this R46 up here. This pot here is very, very touchy, and that's the one that you use to uh, null out. Where is R46? Right here, to null out this circuit right here, which is, again is going into the MUX chip and going into the A to D converter. Am I calling this the right thing? 4051. Uh, I think that's a mul it's called a multiplexer. Anyway, <laughs> so it's pretty pretty daggone important that you get this right or all the ranges will be completely off. I mean this affects everything. So I put a 10 turn pot in there. Now, you could definitely have done it with the one turn but this was the one adjustment that was really really sensitive and with the 10 turn it made it piece of cake to adjust. The rest of the pots don't seem to have that problem. You have to move them quite a bit to get it into where you want to adjust it. So it's they're not so sensitive, but that one was the one. The other thing we did was we put the flyback or freewheel diodes on these coils of these relays in the hopes that we will protect these flip-flops over here. So those are the only two mods that I really made. Uh, I had to repair a couple of broken traces in the board. Uh, I think one of those was a legit bad trace. Um, I think two other ones that I repaired were either done by myself pulling a chip out. I had this one over here, this chip. I had, in removing it, I had one trace pull up on me. So I had to fix that. And then there was one other one, uh, not the one that between four, pins 4 and, and 10, on here, but one of the other ones, there was a there was a uh, broken trace that may have been done earlier during troubleshooting, so those needed to be repaired. And then, last but not least, we had this resistor right here, which is over here on this IC41. It's right in line with this adjustment here for your 60 milliamp current source, and it's supposed to be a 15 ohm resistor. The one that was in there was reading 25 ohms, so it was very 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 high so I replaced that with a proper 15 uh, ohm resistor and it's a spot on 15 ohms it's a one percent it's good metal film it's never gonna go bad so that's it uh, it's all working and uh, I want to thank all of you for your participation in the comment section and in the email and all my patrons who really, really came out and helped me on this. And I'll try to post some of this stuff on my Patreon channel and uh, if, if you need it to refer to it and uh, if I can answer any other questions to my limited knowledge. I do know more about this than I did in the beginning for sure. Uh, but. It's a complicated piece of equipment, and uh, I can appreciate what all it can do now. So this will be a good addition to the bench, and you'll see it there in future videos. But that's it for right now. Uh, I'm ready to get on to some other projects, and I'm actually pretty happy to get this off the bench. So until then, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And we'll see you again real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.